Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. Today's pod is our annual Thanksgiving mailbag episode where we answer your questions and give thanks for what has pretty much been a perfect year. No complaints here. <laughs> uh, let's take some questions. Anna Marshall asks, what are your thoughts on the reports that Republicans are pressuring Georgia's Secretary of State to throw out legal absentee votes? Is this even legal? What can be done? John Lovett, what do you think? Um, it is not legal to throw out ballots <laughs> for no reason. Didn't um, even have to didn't even have to Google that one. That one's easy. You know, <laughs> look, sometimes legal questions are hard, especially if you're Rudy Giuliani cosplaying <laughs> as a trial attorney for the first time in uh, you know, many, many, many drinks. Um, questions so, like, where am I? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Pennsylvania. Um, but uh, no, you can't throw out legally cast ballots just because you don't like the outcome of an election. There's even now a question as to whether or not Lindsey Graham acted uh, illegally when he tried to pressure uh, the Secretary of State of Georgia to throw out legally cast ballots. There's a dispute as to what was said. But I would, uh, in my experience, I think when there's a dispute about something uh, uh, Lindsey Graham said, it's probably best to go with um the person who's not lindsey graham uh just because he's uh he lies about a lot of things lies about a lot of stuff and all i'll add to that is i would really suggest checking out um excerpts from the court transcripts not just from rudy giuliani but in general from republican lawyers uh many of whom are trying to get out of representing donald trump or, or donald trump allies in these fights because uh the thing about being a lawyer when you're not on television and you're in court is that you're a member of the bar and with that comes certain obligations like not to lie to a fucking judge's face and so the judge turns to these lawyers who are you know they're you know donald trump is saying it's fraud rudy giuliani is saying it's fraud and then the, the judge turns to these lawyers and says, um, are you, sir, a member of the bar going to say that there uh, were no observers? No, I can't say that. Are you a member of the bar going to say that, that you have evidence of fraud? No, we can't say that. So it's um, I'm really enjoying the difference even, between even Rudy, yeah. even Rudy said uh, in court around the Pennsylvania case, there was no fraud. That, that's not what they were alleging. Even Rudy. I mean, if they take away Rudy's bar license, what does he have? Just, what is his just, cocktail. Bar. just his cocktail. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just a bar. <laughs> yeah, Rudy's used to Judge Gene, uh, you know, hammering down a bag of Franzia and then ruling on his <laughs> statements. He's not used to an actual courtroom, and it's quite funny. Um, but, you know, Anna asks what can be done. Uh, don't worry about this one. Uh, <laughs> Brad Raffensperger, the uh, Secretary of State in Georgia, who was a Republican who's been attacked, who's been getting death threats because he refuses to illegally throw out ballots and he has decided to conduct a fair election and says there's no, no fraud. Um, he has resisted efforts from Lindsey Graham, from Doug Collins, uh, congressman, former congressman of Georgia, to throw out the ballots. And so we don't ha nothing has to be done because Lindsey Graham's scheme and Doug Collins' scheme and Donald Trump's scheme is not gonna work in Georgia. It's not gonna work. Yeah. I would watch watch his interview, uh, Brad Raffensperger's interview with Mehdi Hassan on his Peacock show, because he also talks through the fact that it's not like Georgia is a state that hasn't uh, been focused on voter fraud, right? Like they got rid of ballot harvesting. They have photo ID laws. They have sort of a, a extensive process. Uh, they're auditing the election anyway. So there's a lot. A lot of steps are already being taken to prevent voter fraud. Uh, it barely ever happens in this country. Uh, it seems like Raffensperger is actually being pretty principled here so it's worth watching the whole interview and again you don't have to believe in raffensberger's principles or you know worry that he's going to change his mind what happened is graham called him and said do you have the power to toss all mail ballots in counties found to have higher rates of non-matching signatures so yeah. if the signature match which is a bad law anyway if the sig if you, you have a mismatched signature instead of just throwing out that ballot you throw out all the ballots in the county and and been and Raffensperger said to Graham, no, of course I don't have that power. <laughs> like, so much of this, and everyone, I, everyone's nervous. They're like, oh, well, Republicans are going to do this or that. Like, there are laws in place that if they break, like, the law enforcement and uh, judges and courts will step in. This is the Raff problem that they're facing. Raffensperger yeah, was so concerned about the call that he uh, was advised not to call Lindsey Graham back. <laughs> That's how bad it was. Also, just just to stop on the Lindsey Graham thing for one more second, like 
Lindsey Graham is a senator from South Carolina, which means he has about, about as much official capacity uh, in this matter as you, as me, as anyone listening to this. He's just a famous concerned citizen calling people who will answer. That's what he is. He is a, he's just as a, it's like normally celebrities do this to get like a PlayStation 5 early, but, but <laughs> Lindsey Graham's doing it to try to destroy democracy. Yeah, he's also the fucking chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, so he should be investigated for this fucking bullshit. Um, all right, Nicole Dilly asks, can Biden really legally cancel student loan debt through an executive order? It sounds too good to be true that someone could wave a magic wand and erase debt for millions of people. Tommy, what do you think? Well, lots of smart people seem to think he can. So, I mean, the context is uh, 22 million borrowers had their federal student loans paused and the interest waived through 2020, I believe, because of the pandemic. So that's already happened. And then the Higher Education Act that goes back to 65 authorizes the education secretary to compromise, waive, or release federal student loan debt, which has led smart folks like Elizabeth Warren to argue that that means the president can use an executive order to wipe away their debt. Uh, Warren thinks Biden can cancel up to $50,000 in debt per borrower. So that's a lot of chunk. That's a big chunk of change. Back in March, um, Biden tweeted that we should cancel at least $10,000 in student debt per person, but he wanted that authorized by Congress. Uh, so you know, how you do it is still seemingly important to him. Biden has a, a pretty generous uh, uh, broader student loan plan, but you know, there's a, there's a question then, um, when you have a debt erased, there's a question about whether it will be taxed or not. Jason Furman, former economist at the Obama White House, suggested that it could be. Others have pushed back and said, no, it probably won't. Joe Biden will be in charge of the IRS, so he might have a say in the matter. Uh, but, you know, it seems like a pretty great idea to me. So, there, love it. I want to get to you. There's, there's, there's one other legal question. There's, as you said, Tommy, advocates believe the Higher Education Act gives the education secretary the authority to cancel the debt. There's some people who think that there's a separation of powers issue here because Congress is supposed to be in control of handing out money. And then they say, okay, well, this could be challenged if Biden does it in courts. So what will the courts do? And if the banks and lenders went to court and they won, what would then happen to the borrowers whose debt was already erased? Do they have to then pay that back? So mm -hmm. there are some, some legal questions around this, though, again, like you sure. said, a lot of smart people think that the act does give um, the secretary the authority. Um, Love it. What do you think about sort of uh, this this proposal? So in terms of the, just the tax liability, like one of the reasons people are concerned about that is if you're going to do this in the middle of a pandemic, one of the arguments to do it is that it helps people who are in a dire financial strait and it helps um, get more money back into the economy. If all of a sudden you've issued a tax liability to whatever, 40 million people, suddenly, suddenly, yeah, they, they don't owe money down the line. But right now they owe a bunch of money to the government. It could have a kind of the reverse effect of what you want. The Warren claims and others claim that that, that the president can waive that. Um, through you know, specifically th through, by the way, we should just say they believe they can waive it through the IRS can actually issue a yeah. rule saying that you don't have tax liability on the debt cancellation. Yeah. Now, I, I do think that like uh, Warren and the lawyers who believe that this is legal, like they have a pretty firm ground to stand on. I do think we're back in a conversation about absent like functioning Congress and a functioning kind of system. We are once again looking to executive a action to step in to do the work that probably we would all prefer be done through legislation. I do think it raises a bunch of other problems if you're not doing this as part of broader reforms. I obviously think we should do debt relief and it's an emergency for a lot of people. I don't think that should stand in the way of doing it. But if you're not going to put in other reforms, um, you're still in the same broken system. There's a practical issue to figure out here, which is say on Monday you wipe away the debt of, uh, you wipe away up to $50,000 in debt for everyone who's taken out debt. Tuesday, a bunch of people take out new student loans. What happens to their debt? Do you keep wiping out? Debt? You know, in the this is what you're saying. In the absence of legislation um, fixing the system, you have sort of this system where you're like, are you just sort of wiping away debt every couple weeks? How how does how does it set up? Which I think is a, is a challenge to figure out. Um, yeah. But again, the re the only reason Joe Biden would be doing it this way. Um, and I think one of the reasons that he sort of hedged on the question when he was asked at a press conference uh, last week was that you'd only be doing it if you didn't have a Democratic Congress. If Joe Biden has a Democratic Congress, if we win the two Senate seats in Georgia, then absolutely he will try to pursue debt relief via legislation. 
and not via executive action because it is it's just easier to do that way and it's more legally sound yeah i'd also say too by the way like if we had again like this is not about i i said functioning system functioning uh two-party system in which the republicans were honest and good faith actors because what you could also imagine happening is joe biden basically says i you know i would like to see this broad range of reforms to student debt and to how we pay for college generally uh, making it making it free to go to public colleges all the pieces of his plan that are really good um because then you can do debt forgiveness as part of a longer term plan to make sure that this kind of problem doesn't creep up again and so you could imagine Joe Biden basically using this as a cudgel. If Joe Biden has the authority to cancel $50,000 of student debt, he also has the authority to pause it while negotiations are ongoing to get something done in Congress. So um, I think we'll see. But I think what is exciting and good about this is it changes the debate from will there be student debt forgiveness to will there be student debt forgiveness through Congress or will Joe Biden have to do it alone? Yeah. My only recommendation is like there's a lot of people who support uh, getting rid of this debt who are you know, dunking on people on Twitter uh, who say it might cause resentment uh, among people who've already paid off their loans or people who didn't go to college and don't have loans. And look, I, I get that, right? Like, I, I, I think we should do the policy. My just suggestion to them would be, let's all spend less time dunking on those people and just start to make a broader argument for how it could help the economy, uh, how this could actually trickle down on like tax cuts for billionaires that Republicans always jam through under the guise of this somehow helping working people. I mean, if you got 22 million kids out from under a, a pile of debt and they were able to spend that money on literally anything else, it should benefit all of us and it should be a good thing. And I, I will also say, you know, Jason Furman, who we know who you said Tommy was skeptical of this idea said one thing you can do administratively that that would be very effective is tougher regulation of for-profit colleges oh we should one of the, fuck those for-profit colleges i mean one of the major and, and just Disgusting. in general one, one of the major challenges here with student loans and the cost of college is if the government continues to provide grants and loans to students without doing anything about the rising cost of college all we're doing is sort of, you know, we're, we're trying to like, it's <laughs> we're a not really solving to the, the schools. Problem. It's not, it's, it's exactly, it's not, schools. it's not really solving the problem. And it, it's the same thing as not doing anything about the cost of healthcare and health insurance, but continuing to subsidize people getting health insurance, right? Which is well, what we do. We have to, the source of the problem is the rising cost of college, of healthcare. And that requires regulation of colleges, of the health insurance industry, et cetera. Right. Well, the, the for-profit piece is, is is even is sort of a specific thing that's very egregious. Like, not all for-profit colleges are bad. There were some that were really bad that went after veterans in particular and basically enrolled them in these programs that gave them bogus online degrees that were completely useless and, and got a bunch of uh, people in a pile of debt. So they're just awful, and they've been yeah. protected and defended by the education secretary uh, currently, and it's just horrible. So um, Erica Carpenter asks... I've heard EU leaders like Macron say that they will be more hesitant to work with the U.S. now that they know all agreements can be undone by the election of one idiot. How will this impact the Biden administration? I know he needs to do a lot through executive orders because of McConnell, but can't all EOs just be undone, executive orders, in the next election if, God forbid, a Trumpy candidate wins? Yeah, I guess I would uh, roll my eyes at this Macron's comment a little bit. I mean, love us or hate us, the U.S. is a, a key ally for most European countries. We trade, you know, a trillion dollars worth of goods and services a year. We work at the U.N., we work at NATO, we work on the Iran nuclear deal. So I guess my point is we don't really have a choice. We all have to work together. Uh, I think the French and most other countries are sophisticated enough to know that U.S. political power can swing back and forth from Republican to Democrat uh, and lead to big changes in policy. That's kind of priced into the system in the same way we know that the French, like Macron invented a political party uh, and and ran and won. And that was something new we had to work with. So uh, that's not that doesn't mean that America's reputation and standing in the world wasn't enormously damaged. Like I think Iran, for example, they will be far more hesitant to want to work with us because they were promised a bunch of sanctions relief uh, under the JCPOA. And they lived up to their end of the bargain for a long time, didn't enrich nuclear material, and then got no sanctions relief and actually got hammered even further by the Trump administration. But I'm, I'm less worried about relations with French, the French or Europeans. So, Levitt, I do think, you know, um, government by EO, sort of by executive action or executive order, does sort of highlight the importance of winning these two Senate races in Georgia. Yes, it really does. And, you know, 
I do feel attention. And I think one of the lessons to me about the Trump administration that I'm going to really try not to forget is um, the accrual of, of power to the executive, the reliance on executive orders, the like stretching the bounds of what an executive order can do to make it look more and more like legislation, in part because over the decades, Congress has shifted more authority, given more leeway, given more abilities to the presidency, um, that these things are dangerous when in the hands of Donald Trump. So should, we should be afraid of them, even when they're in the hands of a president we uh, um, have more alignment with. Um, but, you know, right now we're going to have a choice between doing what we can in an emergency around COVID, around the economy, around other long-term challenges versus uh, our fears around executive power. And I, if we had had a, if we have a democratic Congress, we can have the ability to, to um, uh, reestablish some of the congressional prerogatives and do progressive legislation at the same time. But right now we're gonna have to make, unless we win those seats, we're gonna have to make some really hard choices. Uh, Maple Leaf Forever asks, many bridges to repair, but what foreign country does President Biden visit first? I feel like I know who Maple Leaf Forever, what, what their choice is. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, yeah. Uh, so I so, bet Maple Leaf Forever, uh, I bet Biden goes to Canada or Mexico first. Uh, Obama's first trip was to Ottawa in February 2009. Uh, George W. Bush went to Mexico in February, which pissed off the Canadians. Then he went to Canada in April. I think Bill Clinton went to Canada first. Uh, I hope shortly after Biden creates some sort of summit or event, either hosts it or travels to it around climate change to try to get, you know, everybody who is in the Paris Climate Accords uh, to renegotiate. There may already be actually a, a COP, uh, one of the summits on the, on the books that I'm just not aware of. But it would be great uh, to do that, to talk about climate internationally. Uh, you could do something uh, alongside of it that reaffirms the U.S. commitment to NATO. You know, there's lots of ways to do this. Uh, all of your travel will be scrutinized. All of your calls will be scrutinized uh, in ways that border on the absurd. Uh, but it will be really fun to watch Joe Biden go to places and be met with like crowds and jubilation uh, and know that Trump will be watching that on cable news and that it will piss him off to no end. You know, what's funny is Biden. Uh, one thing Biden has said over the years, just all the time, is don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. No one will benefit more <laughs> in the history of human civilization. Been, I'm telling you, the, you, you <laughs> already messaging. see it. You've yeah. already seen it since the election. Like Joe Biden gives a pretty standard set of remarks on COVID or the economy. And everyone's like, oh, my God, he didn't yell at us. He's got plans. It was calm. Yeah. It was like, it's like you it, tweet it's not, per day. It's not like super impressive, but it just it feels so much better. <laughs> you know, what's funny is we say that now, but you know that the other thing that's going to happen is they're going to cover Biden, especially when he's on foreign soil, as if Donald Trump and his bananas behavior abroad didn't happen. And he's going to be held right back. Oh, oh like the the, the, oh. the definition of gaffe is about to uh, uh, drop again. <laughs> like Love it's it. going to happen. And then, and then they're all going to walk around being like, well, we were all tough on Donald Trump. So we're tough on Joe Biden, too. That's just the way it is. L Love it. It's already happening. M Margaret Ugh. Sullivan at The Washington Post, who I, I think is brilliant and I love her stuff, wrote the tired like Obama was hard on the media thing because there were leak investigations and because he didn't do an interview with the Washington Post. And then she singled out the fact that in Vietnam he did an interview with Anthony Bourdain, who is like a brilliant writer, someone who cares about Vietnam, someone who's taught me more about foreign places and foreign policy than most political reporters who wanted to have a conversation about how to get rid of fucking landmines that were sprinkled across Asia after Vietnam, like super substantive, important stuff. And like, you know, it was this like self-interested, ridiculous critique. And it, I'm like, I just, I need to, I need to maybe stop reading so much stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think like, the Biden strategy during the campaign, which is like ignore Twitter and a lot of the like DC, you know, crap is probably a good thing to continue. I, it's, you can't, fighting with them never works. Just fucking ignore them. Uh, <laughs> that's, 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 my, uh, that's my proposal. By, by the way, um, uh, uh, physician, heal thyself uh, is what I would say to you, John. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, do you think, what, is, is hypocrisy something we avoid on this podcast? No, I, I, no. I love it, but it's sort of my brand. <laughs> I'm rolling in it right now, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of ignoring things, uh, Allison Griffin asks, let's talk about Parler. <laughs> Do you think it is something to worry about since it appears to be an echo chamber for the worst ideas of white supremacists? Or is the site there to just blow off steam? Love it. What do you Ec think? Echo chamber for the worst ideas of, of white supremacists. What is this? The Republican ca caucus meeting? 
Oh my god. Oof. Um. Uh. I honestly U- usually like, you save that kind of humor for the ads, the ad reads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I was, what I would say is um, I've never been to Parlor. Don't plan on going. You know, we talk a lot about how Twitter isn't real life. Um, but there are a lot <laughs> of journal. There's a lot of journalists and like conversations on Twitter that influence the way politics is discussed and that discussion influences coverage in a broader sense. And so I do think there's real value to a lot of the conversation on Twitter, even even if it is very, very frustrating, because it helps set a larger conversation outside of that. I am. It is obviously very worrying to have a yet another kind of festering swamp of right wing nationalism and conspiracy theories. Uh, that said, there's no shortage of them already. Right. Those yeah. exist across the Internet. Um, so, uh, you know, the fact that a bunch of right wing politicians are kind of taking their little pot shots on Twitter. So reporters see it before they go to parlor and post the same shit. I, I don't know what the consequences are. That's obviously not good. Yeah, I- I'm of two minds of this, too. Like the extreme version. And my concern is that like any safe space for hate speech is bad. The Christchurch killer posted his psychotic manifesto on 8chan. He also linked, uh, posted a link to a Facebook Live video of the murder itself. So that is that is horrible to have a safe space for like literal Nazis to gather and plan and incite each other. I think the majority of parlor people are just like whiny, stupid, trolling conservatives, right? It's like, like a bunch of Charlie Kirks running around. And, and the reason I don't think those people are gonna be happy on parlor is because they love to performatively complain about how they're being suppressed and they love to own the libs. And if there's no libs there to own, I'm not sure what they're gonna do, right? If Charlie Kirk is just pretending that liberals hate Thanksgiving to an audience of Dan Bonginos, I'm not sure that's gonna like get him the, the thing that he wants. It's also just worth noting though that Parler is backed by the Mercer family. They are these horrible billionaires who bankrolled everything Steve Bannon did. So, you know, TLDR, we need a wealth tax uh, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we got some wealth tax. Wow. That's great. Yeah, I like that. Um, all right, we have a few questions about Georgia. Adam Gray asks, given what we saw with McGrath and Harrison, uh, Amy McGrath and Jamie Harrison, nine-figure fundraising but both lost by big margins, is there any reason to think donating money to Georgia races will help versus non-financial stuff? Uh, I will take a shot at this one. So I think the um, the partisan and demographic makeup of a state is by no means the only factor but probably the most determinative factor in electoral outcomes and what's going to happen. Presidential margin of victory in a given state is over 10 points. It is most likely not a competitive state. doesn't matter who your candidate is, what the message is. It's just not going to be competitive. If it's under five points, it's always a competitive state. Between five and 10, unlikely, but who knows. In these competitive races, a great, well-funded candidate with a strong message and good organizing really matters, and that is Georgia. (laughs) Um, You know, Joe Biden won Georgia. Um, John Ossoff only was down by a point. When you add up the votes in the special election with Warnock and Loeffler, again, Democrats and Republicans, extremely close. So when you have states that are extremely close, money very much matters in the outcome. Funding a campaign matters in the outcome. The ads that run, the organizers they hire, that all matters. I think looking back on it, like, that Amy McGrath race was never really competitive. <laughs> it just wasn't. Mitch McConnell won by like 20-something points. Donald Trump won by 30-something points, beat Joe Biden. Now, again, people can be forgiven for thinking that it might be competitive because Andy Bashir, a Democrat, won the governor's race in that state. But of course, the Bashir name in Kentucky is famous, and that might have been uh, you know, a, a special situation. You get the situations where like Doug Jones wins a special election in Alabama, right? That was a unique situation and that, you know, poor Doug Jones lost this time around. So there are outliers for sure. But when you have a state that is as red as Kentucky, it doesn't matter how great the candidate is or how much money they have or how the messages have. It's just going to be a hard it's going to be a hard race. Um, And so I do think that, like, when you're thinking about where to give money for races, you know, think about the races that where the state is competitive and close. Now, there's a whole nother conversation about, like, how do we make red states competitive? Well, that you you have a lot of grassroots organizing and a presence in the state but sometimes that can take 5 10 15 years again look at georgia um so anyway i i would i would uh, i would definitely recommend giving in in that situation but i don't know if you guys have a different different view no well said i mean biden just won yeah, yeah biden just won it's a big deal uh, 
Um, Jessica Pinnell asks also about Georgia. What accounts for the disparity in votes between the two races in Georgia? Do we expect that same gap again? And if so, what happens if Warnock doesn't get 50%? Uh, Tommy? So I assume we mean the disparity of votes between Ossoff and Warnock. And that is because Ossoff was running against David Perdue and then some libertarian candidate, whereas Warnock was running against like 20 some odd candidates, including several Democrats in the vote got split up uh, a bunch of different ways, including some really confused people who voted for a Lieberman, which was just never acceptable. So uh, not getting to 50 percent in, in those uh, elections triggers a runoff between the two candidates. And then I believe it's winner take all, no matter what, right? Once the runoff happens in the runoff, whichever candidate gets the most votes wins. That's just the Georgia law. So, um, you know, I think the big question is, like, Biden got 2.47 million votes in Georgia. John Ossoff got 2.37 million votes. It's hard to compare with the other race because it was so many different candidates. But so there's two possibilities for the split, right? There were voters who cast a ballot for Biden and then also Purdue, split ticket voters. Um, or there were voters who just voted in the presidential and didn't vote in the Senate. Uh, and we know there was a mix of both because there were 46,000 more votes cast in the presidential race than in the Senate. But then there was about 100,000 vote difference between Biden and Ossoff. So you have a mix of voters. So I think the question is in Georgia, how do we get people who either just voted for Biden to vote for Ossoff and Warnock or people who voted for Biden and then Purdue and Loeffler to maybe change their votes and vote for Ossoff and Warnock? So that's, that seems to be the challenge. Or new voters or registered new voters. Or, or registered new voters are also just, you know, you, it's sort of like a Dutch Dutch auction, like go in the opposite direction. Like, Dutch okay. Oven. A Dutch a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Is that what you, that's what you said, right? It yeah, is. He sure. Does. Lovett okay. thinks that the strategy in Georgia should be <laughs> Dutch oven strategy. What are we? How old are we? We're we're so we're okay. We have a lot of recording this week. I don't know what's happening. A lot of recording this, this week. The, no, what like I was going to say is fifth pod that we've done this week. If you you could also maybe like uh, it seems unlikely to me that you will have a turnout in the runoff that equals the presidential, right? Like that would be seem to be like pretty crazy. And so actually, yeah. yeah, like we need to go after the split ticket voters or the people that just voted in the presidential. But also, it seems to me one of the reasons Loeffler and Purdue are trying to nationalize the race and Trumpify the race with these like kind of spurious attacks on the secretary, the Republican secretary of state of Georgia is, you know, their hope they need a Trump like turnout. Um, and so they're hoping that with by bringing Trump's energy evil vibes into this thing they can uh keep a greater percentage than we can keep and so that's part of the fight too like you know how many yeah, of their I mean, voters do we lose versus how many do we lose and the reason that it's close that it should be close is that traditionally runoffs you have high propensity voters right people who vote all the time <clears throat> high propensity voters tend to be college educated voters in the past college educated voters were republican voters <laughs> now college educated voters are very democratic and you have low propensity voters, voters that don't show up as much, are both non-college educated white people, those are all the Trumpers that came out in, in, in 2020 for Trump, and you have a lot of um, sometimes black voters and Latino voters can be more low propensity on the Democratic side, even though a, lot, even though a ton of them came out in uh, 2020 for Joe Biden. So we do have, it, it's gonna be more competitive than past runoff elections because now Democrats have a lot of high propensity voters. Um, okay. Charlotte Greenbaum asks, how will crooked media's focus or mission change under the Biden-Harris administration? What does crooked look like? Uh, we've actually talked about this a lot. You know, we said from the very beginning that while Trump winning uh, led us to start crooked media, it was uh, always about the fact that Trump represented a bunch of deeper systemic problems in our economy, our politics, our media, our culture. And, uh, you know, Trump gone, those problems remain, those challenges remain. I think one lesson of the last four years is we need to not just pay attention during elections. We need to pay attention every day in between. And our goal uh, continues to be to help turn people's anxieties, hopes, fears into political action, to give them a place where there's a political conversation that's not just about being an observer, but being a participant. Um, and with Joe Biden in the White House, we have a very short window to do as much good as humanly possible in in the between now and the midterms. It's never been more important that people stay in the fight. You know, Trump gone, everyone paying attention. We finally have the chance to do some real good. That really depends on sustained activism. Sustained activism is how we can make sure that Joe Biden keeps his promises and make sure that Joe Biden is successful. We can be we can be his ally and we can uh, 
We can provide pressure. We can also provide a backstop. You know, for so many years, Republicans in Congress have said, oh, I can't go back to my people with this this proposal. I'll get killed. The base, the the Freedom Caucus, what have you. We need to be behind Democratic politicians uh, uh, creating the pressure and the support where necessary to make sure they have the tools in what will be incredibly divisive, incredibly difficult negotiations to get as much good done as possible. Is that as ideal as what it would be if we had a full Democratic Senate? No, we should keep fighting for it. But even absent that, we all have to just stay in the fight. Yeah, I just I have three quick points. The three of us talked about starting a media company even before Trump was elected. <laughs> and we did that because we thought that right-wing media outlets are poisoning people's brains and non-right-wing media outlets don't give people the information, the opportunities, the encouragement to actually fix what's broken about politics. That is what's different about crooked. That's why we have Vote Save America. That's why we've been in this in this fight for so long. We also, I think as we you know, have now a Democrat in power in the presidency, a Democratic House, and we have the opportunity to do some things. We've always wanted Crooked to be a place where people can participate in a healthy, respectful, productive debate about the future of liberalism, broadly defined from the left to the center and everything in between. So we want to have that debate. It can be feisty at times, but we want to have a respectful debate about that. I worry that democracy will not survive if the coalition that beat Donald Trump in 2020 fractures or disengages from politics in any way, <laughs> right? Like we have now seen Trump or no Trump, Republican politicians are just, they are all in on crushing democracy. Uh, and and we have, to, we have to beat them. And if that isn't our focus, then we won't be as lucky as next time. You know, I've been talking, I've been saying like, don't be worried about the coup succeeding this time. And I really don't believe it will, but next time it could be. This is a very, this is a very closely divided country. Joe Biden won by small margins in the swing states. And if we don't keep our shit together and keep energized for 22, 2022, 2024, we could be in some real trouble, real trouble. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just very briefly, like, let's help Biden do the things that he ran on and that we want him to do. We can focus more on on issues and down ballot races when Donald Trump isn't doing something horrible every day. We need to do a much better job fighting disinformation. Uh, we talked a little bit about Parler and the Mercer family pumping money into these right wing wannabe Twitters, but the Federalist, Breitbart, Real Clear Politics, those aren't real businesses. Those are pieces of shit rags that are propped up by right wing billionaires because they're used as political weapons. So we need to fight back on that. We want to focus on, ap on activism, focus on building community around progressive activism. We want to lift up inspiring candidates like, you know, AOC, Jamal Bowman, like the ne that next generation. And then let's just make a bunch of cool shows and broaden the audience and bring more people in uh, and get people to care about this stuff. Because, like, I think talking to a lot of people who are part of Vote Save America uh, has been so rewarding because they talk about how meaningful the experience was for them, right? Because you think about like getting on a campaign, like, oh, all polit politics is ugly, knocking on doors sucks, you know, cold calls suck. Actually, it was incredibly rewarding and can be inspiring and makes you feel great about yourself. And we just need to like help people experience that. We got big plans in 2021, everyone. Stay more tuned, shows, yeah. more hosts, more, more of it all. Um, okay, let's take some fun questions. Uh, Tommy, Sam Mastow wants to know what's going on with the Patriots. Um, <laughs> Watching the Jets game on Monday night was agonizing, uh, but we look great against Baltimore. We'll see how the Texans game goes. Listen, Sam, we lost the greatest quarterback <laughs> of all time, Tom Brady. We lost Rob Gronkowski, one of the best beer bongers slash tight ends of all time. Beer Cam Newton is amazing, <laughs> but like he's got to learn a new system, and he got COVID, and he can't practice, so cut him, some, cut him a break. We had a bunch of players opt out because of COVID, including like Dante Hightower and Patrick Chung, right? So that's a big hit to the defense. They have good reasons, by the way, right? We had players with the babies. We had players, a cancer survivor. Julian Edelman just had knee surgery. But like, look, you know, Jacoby Myers is out there catching and throwing touchdowns. So fuck off, Sam. Okay, Bill wow. Belichick just tweeted a statement on Nagorno Karabakh. So this is, this is Bill this Belichick is touching all my my is zones Bill, today. Do you think Bill Belichick is a world out? What's happening? Someone, someone told me that Bill Belichick has an Armenian assistant who must have filled him in on all this. Wow, uh, that was. I'll just, I did not expect to see that. What, what do you think? What do you think about the past this year? Love it. I I think it's um, look. Obviously, people are noting. Um, 
the big hole that Tom Brady has left in your um, squad. But on the other hand, he is bringing a lot of um, good energy to his new role as the lead counselor for the Wisconsin recount for Trump. So <laughs> um, that's pretty cool. The rest was incomprehensible to me. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Talk, talk about talk about new Tampa Bay voters that uh, turned the election yeah. to Trump in Florida. OK, so. <laughs> Whitney Fitzpatrick wants to know what Tommy and I order at Dunkin' Donuts. Um, I, ha- I order a, uh, if it's summer, a large iced French vanilla coffee. Um, <laughs> yep, that's right. <laughs> Get Milk that with a nice sugar. croque madame. I'll, also put the sugar in, yeah, even though the French vanilla is having up. Yeah, the croque madame, no. Then I have a, um, I do the uh, ham, egg, and cheese on an English muffin as a, as a sandwich. What about you, Tom? The, the ham, egg, and cheese on an English muffin is the perfect breakfast. I would obviously prefer a biscuit, but that just can't be an everyday thing. You're going to end up in a bad place. Um, I don't think I had Starbucks until after college. Uh, my the, my job after freshman year was painting the uh, exteriors of houses. And so every morning I'd drag my ass out of bed and get a large iced coffee with cream, you know, a solid uh, half inch of undissolved sugar, which I think is technically called the uh, the Ben Affleck order yep. and that's just as good as it gets now i reached out to a celebrity who is one of the world's biggest um duncan fans uh he mentioned the other day that he got a duncan bathrobe uh josh gondelman <laughs> and he said iced coffee year round unless uh you work outside and it's cold best donut is blueberry cake glazed blueberry favorite savory item is the beyond sausage sandwich so wow Look at look at your original 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 reporting from Beyond Sausage Vitor. Greta Thunberg over there. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I don't know. Did you guys go to to Starbucks in in high school? Never. No, I, I was really- Dunkin' Donuts my entire life through college, even through after college, until I think I moved to DC and suddenly there were a few Starbucks around and there wasn't enough Dunkin' Donuts. That's what happened. It was Starbucks for me was just a place to go to the bathroom for a very long time. <laughs> um, that's really what it was. Uh, okay, Kelsey DeChambeau wants some book recommendations. I didn't pick this question. This is from Tommy because I don't read books, as you all know. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did. I did choose this one. Um, uh, I'm currently reading Homeland Elegies by Ayad Akhtar, which is amazing. I think all of Rick Perlstein's books are great. I always harass you guys about these. Nixon Land, haven't read Reagan Land yet, but I bought it. Over the summer, uh, I was reading these Ben McIntyre books that are like really cool, real spy stories. Uh, I read a really good but super depressing book called king leopold's ghost which is about colonialism in the congo uh the devil's chessboard to start a war by robert draper about iraq that's about all i remember wow i have some jeez hey what what do you what do you what do you what else do you do to relax (laughs) i got i got a kindle man i know how to use it but it's just very those are some intense books also, I yeah. feel like we're I feel like we're talking to you most of the day. When are you, <laughs> when are you reading? I, w- I read to wind down, but it's not ideal to wind down with a book about how 10 million people in the Congo were killed by the evil Belgians who were no. colonizing it. Yeah. I have um I just started A Promised Land. There it is by Barack Obama. Hmm. I bought it. It's great. Hmm. How is it? I haven't started yet. So far, so good. Heard it's I a can't wait to see what hap- I can't wait to I'm see what kidding. happens. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. How's it going to uh, end? One, <laughs> one of those Sunday shows I was watching, like Guy Benson or whatever, was like mocking Ugh. Obama for having uh, written three books. He's like about himself. It was like back to the old like arrogance trope. And I was like, hey, man, you're like a Fox News guy and wrote a book. So maybe the f- first black president can write a couple. I don't know. Yeah, just a thought. He's, he's a person that doesn't matter. <laughs> Love it. You have any books? So I, I've read, I would recommend three books. One, uh, From Bacteria to Bachenbach by Daniel Dennett about evolution, AI, and consciousness and bringing them all together. It was a fascinating book. I really enjoyed it. And it, you know, it, the one thing I'd say is Daniel Dennett, is, he's trying to develop a, a theory of consciousness and it's fascinating, but you kind of get to the end and you realize that like, wow, it's a really hard problem. I just read a book called Aurora by Kim Stanley Robinson, recommended by Sarah Wick, who runs our company. Um, Mm -hmm. We were both looking for a follow-up to a book called Seven Eves by Neil Stevenson, which is a fascinating sci-fi book, and it was great. Aurora is a great book. Those are my two recommendations. Excellent. Um, Love it. Another question for you. Maurice Watson asks, 
I'm an escape room designer. If you could create an escape room game based on the past four years, what would its theme be? What would you call it? So that's really interesting. Um, it's a great question. Thank you. Uh, I was thinking about this, and what I was thinking about is you really want something that where as you're in the escape room, the puzzles get harder as you go because with each passing moment, the democratic and institutional tools at your disposal to escape uh, begin to dwindle. So you can imagine an escape room where every few minutes the um, the two sides of the room get closer, like uh, when they're in the trash compactor in Star Wars. And at each moment, you have the 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 squeeze of anti-democratic movements and the institutional rot are coming at you from both sides as you try to solve a puzzle on the wall ahead of you to convince enough people to let you out. That was my pitch. Ooh, that's, that's a fun pretty one. cool. Uh, that's my. I pitch. got a couple. You got some? Oh, great. So, escape a Tinder date with Stephen Miller. You have to find your way out of some like <laughs> you know moderate to low priced restaurant without you know getting like a tiki torch in your face or something. Um, escape with a gentleman C. That's when Jared Kushner's dad buys your way into the escape room and then you just like kind of walk right out. It's like not a very hard one. Um, <laughs> escape a communal restroom when Steve Bannon heads toward the stall. Is that too graphic for everybody? Oh my goodness! Wow, <laughs> we're at the end here. We got we've been yeah. doing we've been doing four years of pods. Four years of pods. Then I had some other ones that I probably shouldn't say. But, you know, I think we could start with that. I think, That's look, like, I think it's no, no bad ideas in a brainstorm. No bad. Better, you know, uh, other theme options that I've seen in the real world are Jumanji, you know? Uh, so <laughs> Sylvia Crump asks, in seven years, I never thought I could have too much time with my doodle, but it's happened. <laughs> Any advice on how to keep our relationship fun while working 60 hours a week remotely and living in an apartment? Have you tried role-playing? <laughs> do, yeah, do we think Sylvia has a partner named Doodle, or are we talking about a dog? I think we're, we're talking, talking about, about a dog, dog. Tommy. I think we're talking about, I mean, a, we're talking about well, a little tiny they're dog. They're different, very different answers. So, <laughs> I will say I've never been happier to have uh, have have Leo with us here in uh, in quarantine since March. <laughs> it's been a it's been a saving grace. Yeah. What about you guys? We play a lot of tug of war. Maybe a couple walks a day. I, I don't know that. I don't know. I'm not sure if the walks are for me or if they're for Luca, because when I try to put the leash on her, she literally hides behind the couch. But, um, you know, I think the dogs are happy. I wouldn't worry about it. The dog just wants to be with you. Nana Murano asks, what is the worst Thanksgiving side dish and why is it string beans? <laughs> I think I think string beans are pretty bad. I also don't. I like string beans. Yams. Candied yams. Not a fan. Candied yams make no sense. Uh, it's a very look. I get. Like, they're already sweet. You don't need to put, it doesn't make any sense. Like, they're, they come sweet. They're yams. They're sweet potatoes. They're very sweet. So why would you put a layer of marshmallows on top of it? That's too much like a dessert. That's too much like a dessert. I don't ever, I've never liked it. And one thing I'll just say growing up um, is uh, over the years, the the ratio of yams to marshmallows in my home became frankly near criminal by the end robert lovett was just scooping marshmallows onto his plate no like maybe a just a, a kind of like a it's almost like a dry martini like get hey i'd like what what i'd like Spritz. with my candied yams is um can you can you just put a yam next to it while it's cooking so it gets some yam flavor from the oven and then put marshmallows on my plate that was the that was the mm. vibe at the end of my childhood uh for thanksgiving man you guys are wrong about yams. Yams are good. String beans I, suck. Bean casseroles I, suck. I, I was looking around. You people posting cauliflower options are monsters. Get that shit out of here. I, I'm not really thing, I, I will say this. I am shocked by how much taking a bunch of cauliflower and mashing it up tastes like mashed potatoes. Mm. And I really like I'm into it. Obviously, not in a keto uh, emotional or practical phase right now of my life. That's not the energy of this part of the pandemic. We are eating what we see when we want it at any moment. But in better, you know, in more um, disciplined times, I'm yeah. pro cauliflower. That's yeah, you fry up some cauliflower and make it buffalo cauliflower. That's delicious. But again, that's, that's, that's okay, that's, John. We're not at the goddamn cheesecake factory. This is Thanksgiving. <laughs> not about buffalo yeah. cauliflower. But, yeah, get figure. that. What it, I'm just yeah. telling when did you, you what I like. I'm not saying it's. I did not. War claim on that was Thanksgiving. A Thanksgiving side dish. I'm just saying. War awesome. on Thanksgiving. 
What do you, yeah, what Boston do you have? It would be a great addition to the table. Frankly. It would be a great addition to the table. I just want to make one more point on buffalo cheese cauliflower too. before cheese we move on. Too. Put some bacon on those cheese fries. Hey, restaurants. We're on to you. You can't charge buffalo wing prices for buffalo cauliflower. All right? It's a fucking scam. It's just six pieces of cauliflower. Just because it's the same, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it, we're charging chicken prices here. <laughs> it's outrageous. <laughs> skin on mashed potatoes or skin off? I'm skin on. I'm pro skin on. I just I say throw know. those throw those skins right in there. Whatever. I, I guess maybe not. I don't know. I love mashed potatoes. Mashed potatoes, gravies. Brussels sprouts, again, like you're going to put some bacon in with the Brussels sprouts, then I'll eat them. But that's ruining the whole point of the healthy Brussels sprouts, you know. Anyway. Lizzo8 asks, favorite cheese? This is our last question. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> favorite cheese? I'm um, Gouda and feta. I like a, a sharp, hard cheese, like an aged Gouda, an aged cheddar. Okay. Obviously, it's, it's situational dependent. Um, you know, there are cheeses that are great in various circumstances. The one thing I will say is um, I'm never interested in a goat cheese. I don't really care for it. I don't really want it. I don't want well, anything to do with cheese. it. I love goat cheese. I love goat cheese. I like feta, but like feta this. Better, like, feta better than goat, but I also love a goat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, Feta beta. Uh, if you yeah. live in LA, there's a great place called uh, Say Cheese, and it's fun because the guy who works there is great because he'll ask you what you like. You'll try to answer. He'll be just incredibly disappointed in you and then give you a better idea. Uh, and then if you live in Boston, uh, check out Wasik's Cheese Shop in Wellesley. That used to be one of my, my dad and my favorite place on the planet. Nice family run joint. Good people. Love a good cheese store. Love a good cheese. Well, I wish you all a Thanksgiving filled with plenty of cheese and delicious side dishes. Um, I realize a lot of people are not celebrating with the usual family and friends this year because uh, the former president or the outgoing president let a pandemic run wild through the country. So uh, that sucks, but um, I hope everyone still has a, a very good Thanksgiving at home. Yeah, thanks everybody for listening. Thanks, thanks for listening. For listening. After four long years. Thanks for listening and thanks for uh, stepping up in this election in an incredible way uh, and volunteering and donating and making calls and everything that you all did. That's, that is what I will be grateful for at the end of this year. And though I didn't highlight them in the document because I knew I'd get a bunch of shit for it, thank you for the questions about the haircut. I did it myself. I did it myself. I don't know how you do that. How do you, how do you cut the back? I'll, I'll Thank you, Tommy, for suggesting that I share the time release video. I'll do it. I did oh, not. Where are going to put it? I did not. Uh, Jordan didn't send us any questions about your haircut. <laughs> oh, they were in there. They were oh, you in were, there. You were <laughs> they were in there, John. Love it. Love it. Love it's digging through the menchies, folks. He's, look, he's looking for those haircut questions. <laughs> Most people Why are, are upset so handsome, with me. John. I am sick of those questions. <laughs> sick of them. So a lot of you have been asking me why, why I'm so handsome. <laughs> A few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, if you live in Georgia, or if you know anyone who lives in Georgia, December 7th is the deadline to register to vote in the January 5th runoffs that will determine control of the Senate. If you would like to help organizers in Georgia register voters, we've got you covered. For every $2 raised, a group we worked with in the general called Register to Vote will be able to reach one new voter with the materials they need to register. Again, that's a $2 donation, one new voter. Go to votesaveamerica.com slash register GA, register GA to help. Uh, Got to get everyone registered in Georgia and out to the polls. Um, also, we just dropped a ton of new holiday merch in the Crooked store. There's new Pod Save America gear and other fun stuff from all your favorite Crooked pods. Check it out at crooked.com slash store. You can do all your holiday shopping. Isn't that great?